Thanks for joining us. And this is a session on how BuzzFeed built a great user experience using BigQuery and Looker. Um, I'm Rami Hassanay, and I'm a customer engineer for the Google Cloud team supporting BuzzFeed. And coming up shortly will be Nick Hardy, who's a senior business analyst over at BuzzFeed, who's going to kind of go through the story of who BuzzFeed is, not that any of you don't know who they are, <laughs> but uh, kind of take you through their journey of heading onto BigQuery, um, all the kind of hiccups that they went through, the problems they were trying to solve, where they are today, and kind of where they want to go in the future as well, um, and not forgetting, obviously, what they're using and uh, taking advantage of with Looker. So we'll have a Q&A session at the end, so please try to save any of your questions uh, for that. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Nick. Uh, hi, everybody. Like Rama said, I'm Nick Hardy. Uh, I'm on the data science team at BuzzFeed. Thank you for the intro, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about how we thought about surfacing data to our users um, and why that's so important to us as an organization. Um, so before I do that, I want to just sort of set the stage and talk about our work. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with our content, but I think a lot of people don't realize sort of the breadth of the type of work that we're doing and also all the platforms that it lives on. And I think that that's really important for context for the way that we think about our data problems. So of course, we kind of have our classic BuzzFeed content like the dress. I'm sure you guys are all team blue and black or white and gold. We can talk about that after. Uh, but we also have our news content, which actually recently moved onto its own domain. So that came with its own set of fun challenges. Uh, we have our newly launched lifestyle vertical, which is called As Is. And then we also have a bunch of video content, which lives on a bunch of different platforms. So of course, Tasty, uh, quite big on Facebook. A lot of people actually don't realize that this is BuzzFeed, but it is. Um, and then also things like Worth It, which live on YouTube. Um, so that's actually kind of a great sort of segue into the way that we think about our data and some of the problems that we have to solve. So I'm just going to give you guys some quick stats so you can understand sort of the scale of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so we get about 9 billion monthly content views. That's coming from all of our different platforms. So that's BuzzFeed.com, that's our apps, it's Facebook, it's YouTube, it's Instagram, it's Snapchat. Um, about 200 million monthly unique visitors to BuzzFeed.com specifically, uh, tens of thousands of assets. So we kind of actually have a unique problem sort of taking all the statistics and attaching them to metadata, specifically for content that's living on multiple platforms, uh, and data from at least 20 platforms. Now, because we're a content company, content analytics are kind of at the center of everything we do. And we actually have really place a huge emphasis on making that the role not just of our data science and analytics team, but actually everybody in the company, and especially the people who are making stuff. So this is actually a slide that um, I stole from our CEO, Jonah, who has a really great philosophy for sort of the way that he thinks about these things. And we like to think about these things in terms of sort of the feedback loops that we're creating, right? So people who are making stuff are at the center of everything that we're doing, but they're also pushing this content out to all different places, to our site, to our apps, to all these different distributed platforms. And what we sort of get back in return is data and learnings, and also, if we're lucky, sometimes some money. But what that also means is that our reality is that we're left sort of grappling with data coming in from all of these different platforms. And this is actually just a sampling of the different things that we're working with. Um, but as you can imagine, we sort of are stuck with this problem of things coming in in different formats. Some stuff is time series. Some stuff is aggregate. So that's sort of kind of the heart of what we're trying to solve. So great segue to my problem. As a data team, how do we consolidate all this data in one place? make it easy for hundreds of users with varying skill sets to understand. So of course, we have data scientists, analysts, engineers working, looking at this stuff. But we also have content creators. We also have people on our business team. So we have a really broad spectrum in terms of people's expertise and comfort with data, which actually creates a, a sort of unique problem of its own in terms of the way that we want to display this stuff to users and how easy we need to make it for them to understand. Uh, and then, of course, how do we accomplish these first two goals without putting an enormous and continual burden on our data and engineering teams? Right? So that's actually going to be a really central piece of what I talk about today. So how do we actually do it? Uh, I'm going to say some things today that will probably make it easier said than done. And I really want to emphasize before I say any of those that this was a big process for us. And it took, really took a village in terms of, um, the, number of uh, the number of people, the number of teams that worked on it. And I actually have a number of my great teammates sitting here in the fourth row here, so you can come talk to us after. Um, so the first piece of this was building a strong foundation. And again, I'm going to oversimplify a little bit here. Um, but what it really came down to for us was one critical piece. And that was really just getting everything in the same place. So for us, that was BigQuery. Um, obviously, that's me presenting a grossly oversimplified version of what it took to get there. 
Um, so I can talk a little bit about the infrastructure that we use to do that. Uh, and if you guys have more specific questions about this, we can cover it more in Q&A, or you can come find us after, and I'd be happy to sort of chat through it. But basically, what we, what we ultimately landed on was that in order for this to work, in order for us to accomplish our goals, we needed to funnel everything through the same pipeline and land it in the same place. Now, we're very fortunate at BuzzFeed that one of our VPs of engineering was one of the people who co-authored NSQ, so we had a great sort of data pipeline to sit on top of. So everything runs through there, and it lands in GCS, and then ultimately in BigQuery, which is sort of what we can use to surface it back up to all of our users. You'll see some internal tools that we've built in here as well. I'll talk a little bit about those, but not too much. And again, if you have questions, just come find us after. We'd be happy to chat about it. So once you kind of have that foundation in place, you have all your data in BigQuery. Now you have the real task ahead of you of sort of building the home that your users are going to live in. And I like to think about this in terms of building with bricks and not straw, because you're trying to build something that's going to last for the long haul. Um, so when we thought about this, we sort of knew that we had two big groups that we were building for. One was going to be the data team, and then the other was going to be the users. So I'm going to sort of talk about those in two steps, talk about the data team first and then the user second. Um, so the first thing we knew was going to be super, super critical for our data team in particular to accomplish its goals was going to be finding a way to minimize the friction it took to get new data in particular in the warehouse. This was something that was a huge problem for us as our, team, as our company went from being a company that made list posts that lived on a website to suddenly being a company that was publishing across a bunch of different platforms and had content living in all different places. Every time we needed to um, upload new data before we had BigQuery, it was this very, very laborious task for us where we were writing new table schemas, writing migrations, bothering people for backfill, and that was something that just didn't work. So when we set out into our adventure of moving everything over into BigQuery, that was one of the things that was most important to us during the build out. So there were a couple of things that we, we did in terms of the way that we architected the system um, that served to, that have proven to be super, super important for us and had allowed us to move much more quickly than we were in the past. Um, so the first one is that all of our pipeline data just goes straight into GCS. Seems like kind of a simple face value thing, but it's actually super important because what that means is that we don't have to do any work as a data team to get stuff into the place that it needs to be for us to get it into BigQuery. If it passes through the pipeline, it's there. The second one was that all it required for us to actually import data is writing a JSON schema. So previously, like I said, we had to write these migrations. We had to bother people for backfill. Now all of that's built in. All you do is write a config for what you want your table to look like. You deploy that. Your data's there. You can deploy those tables at any time with a review from your teammate. You're not blocked by the data engineering team. And you get your backfill for free, which is something that was super, super crucial for us. All you do is write in a start date. As long as the log files are there, you'll get that data back to whatever start date you set. So this has been huge for us, and it's totally changed the way that we think about our workflow and actually getting the data that we need into our system so that we can surface it to our end users. So once we've done that, we have a couple of other things that were super important. And the biggest one of these was actually giving analysts and data scientists the tools they need to build for less technical users. So we had taken a philosophy in the past where we had actually built a lot of stuff in-house. And when we were just a, a publisher that made list content that lived on the website, like I said earlier, that actually served us really well because we had something that was custom built to our needs. But it didn't scale very well. As soon as we sort of started publishing on all these other platforms, it became a really, really big burden for us to find a way to incorporate that new stuff into dashboards because we were suddenly relying on our engineering team to help us sort of do the whole process of how do we redesign this, how do we do this whole thing. So we knew we needed a better system that would allow us to iterate more quickly. Because like I said, this is sort of the core of the way that we think about everything we do. We really want to be able to power that feedback loop for our content creators. So what we ultimately landed on was that we needed to use a third-party solution, and the one that we picked was Looker. Um, I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with, this, uh, with Looker, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about why it works for us uh, and why it might work for you. So why did we choose Looker? Um, like I said, one of the biggest things that we found was going to be huge for us was the minimal dev overhead. You do need to have a little bit of maintenance at the initial setup, but once that's sort of in place, your data team can actually do a lot of the heavy lifting because Looker manages a lot of the front end, and you're really just sort of managing the data modeling piece, which is something that most data teams can do on their own. Um, the second thing that worked really, really well for us, and keep in mind those sort of varying skill sets that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about this, is that it can support both a general and a specific use case. So what does that actually mean? 
Looker actually has created different versions of their experience for people who have different levels of comfort working with data. So they call this explore versus dashboards. There are you know, sort of different ways that you can think about what that actually means. This example that you're seeing here is a dashboard. So this is a very curated experience that someone who's a little less comfortable working with raw data might see. This is actually a real dashboard that we have. This is showing you uh, completions and results for a specific quiz. So if you're someone who's writing quizzes for BuzzFeed.com, you want to come in, you want to see what results people are getting, what they're choosing for different questions. We actually are able to serve this all right to you in a very curated Looker experience where all you have to do is put in a URL. So we're taking a lot of the burden off of the end user in terms of having to understand how that data is structured, where it comes from, how to pull it, how to manipulate it. They get the answers that they need super quickly. But we can also support a much more specific use case for someone like an analyst, maybe someone on our finance team. So Looker calls this Explore. The way that it looks is it's essentially a big pivot table that sits right on top of your data warehouse. You have someone on your, on your more technical data team that comes in and, and sort of sets up the modeling layer, which will define the dimensions and the measures and sort of how those things are aggregated. It's all SQL-based. It's a, a language called LookML that's kind of a, a weird hybrid between YAML and SQL. Um, but it's pretty easy to work with, and it allows us to sort of support um, these more specific use cases. So if, let's say, our finance team wants to come in here and cut stuff up by months and countries and all sorts of different things that most users don't need, they have access to do that stuff right here in the tool. Uh, and this is actually the Explorer that undergirds this dashboard I just showed you guys. So you can see how does the two things sort of connect to each other. Um, there were a couple of other things that we found worked really well for us when we were, were looking at Looker and a bunch of other tools. Um, one of the other key ones was that it has tons of off-the-shelf access controls. So this was important for us for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have um, users that are working across these different platforms. Some people might work on, say, Facebook and YouTube, but you might have some people who work on just Snapchat or just Instagram. And one of the things that we found early on was that it was very confusing and overwhelming for them to like, be able to see just everything if that's not what they needed. Um, so this allowed us to sort of partition off the experience and make it a little bit more digestible by only showing people the things that they wanted to see or they needed to see. Um, similarly, you could imagine this become very useful if you have sensitive data in your instance. So the ways that a lot of other people use this is that if they have, say, revenue data or finance data that they only want specific teams to be able to see, you can kind of use it in the same way. We've done that a little bit, but it's something that's sort of a le less important for the way that we think about how this data is surfaced. We really like to democratize and make most things available to most people. Um, another thing that's great is that it's actually version controlled, so it's connected directly to Git. Um, this is super helpful for the modeling layer. It's also extremely helpful when something breaks and you're trying to figure out what happened. Um, you can actually like chase it back to a specific commit. Um, this has also been really helpful because we're using, um, we're relying pretty heavily on a functionality that Looker has that's called PDTs, persistent derived tables. So what it allows you to do is to kind of create your own on-the-fly aggregations that run on a schedule and are cached. Um, so if you, say, have hourly data that you want to roll up daily or monthly, you can actually do this right in Looker. It's all version controlled. You can sort of see how those aggregations are working, how they're changing. Uh, it's something that's worked really well for us, so much so that we're actually starting to steal it into one of our own features, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then it's also been a great prototyping ground. So we still have our home-built home tools. Um, we still rely on those a bunch, sort of as like kind of the front page for the way that a lot of people experience data, with Looker being kind of the, the deeper uh, use case that they have. So this has been a great place for us to sort of um, test out new, ex new data experiences that we want to make available to people and potentially integrate um, into our existing tools, which is actually something you can see we've done with that same quiz data that I showed you. So now we have this tool called Dashboard. This was the old dashboard that I showed you about that was created originally just to show post performance. So we've now gone and taken that more granular quiz performance data and just incorporated it directly into the dashboard experience for all of our quizzes. So this is something that users really like. It reduces the friction. They can kind of see everything they want in one place. Um, and Getting data like that into this experience previously would have been something that would have required a lot more work, a lot more effort, a lot more dev hours. So it's a way that we've sort of been able to reduce the lead time on some of these things and also test much more quickly. Right? I think we would have been much more hesitant to build something like that, um, knowing that it would have required so much dev work previously. And now we were able to kind of just plop it right in there. Um, so I've talked a lot about our data team. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the way that we think about building for our non-technical users, because um, these are really the people that are, are most important, and they're on the front lines. Um, so this boils down to sort of four things that we found in our experience in the many iterations of, of building within Looker. Um, 
the first one, and this is actually a huge reason that we chose BigQuery, is that people want answers really quickly. We sort of were the architects of our own demise in the sense that we had been very thoughtful about the way that we had engineered a lot of our home-built tools. So people were used to things loading really, really quickly. So when we suddenly put them in an environment where they were hitting a data warehouse rather than, say, uh, Castlevania or a Redis cache, um, they were like, why is this taking so long to load? I'm used to like two seconds, and suddenly I'm waiting two minutes for things. So BigQuery was a way for us to alleviate a lot of those problems, uh, create an experience that was much faster and much more attuned to what people were used to, um, particularly you know, when you consider that a lot of these people are non-technical and their eyes kind of glaze over when you start explaining to them that the reason that the thing is slow is not because they did something wrong or you did something wrong, but just because the warehouse is taking a long time or maybe has a big query backlog right now. Um, so that's a place where BigQuery has helped us a lot. Um, another thing we found, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, is that less is more. When we first started working with Looker, we sort of were like, oh my god, we can suddenly open up the whole warehouse to everybody. This is so great. And that actually was really bad because people got into this experience and they were like, I don't know what any of this stuff means. Why are there like six different view metrics? Like, I don't understand the difference between a time series. Like, why does this number not change at all when I add dates? So we've really sort of reeled back a lot of that stuff, tried to simplify, um, really tried to show people sort of the bare minimum of what they need as a starting point, and then scale up from there rather than starting off by kind of opening up the floodgates. Um, to that same point, clearly labeled and described fields are everything. We made a huge mistake early on of relying on less technical users to understand, oh, this is an aggregate, this is not an aggregate. It just was a big mistake. And we actually lost a lot of trust that it took us a little while to build back. Um, so this is something that I like, can't emphasize highly enough. And as we sort of work through a lot of these challenges, we've actually imposed a very strict style guide on our technical users that is requiring them to do a lot of these things because of how important we found it to be. Uh, and then the last piece, sort of in tune to what I showed you guys on the last slide, um, we've really tried not to fight existing workflows if we don't have to. So if users already have a tool that they're used to going to, if there's a way for you to sort of integrate the different things you're doing together, that's something that we've found works super, super well. So now that I sort of watch you guys through all of this, where has it actually gotten us? Where are we today? Um, so this is our usage as of um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we have hundreds of terabytes of data across 300 plus tables accessible to our analysts and our users via BigQuery. I've been told that we actually are just starting to cross into, into petabytes territory now with some of the new stuff that we've been importing. Um, we're running over 100,000 queries a day. So bear in mind, I've talked a lot about Looker and supporting our non-technical users, but look, BigQuery is also supporting all of our different technical use cases, so uh, machine learning models, um, all of the sort of regularly scheduled jobs. So you can see um, Looker actually is only about 5 to 10% of our total workflow in a day, but we're really relying on BigQuery super heavily for all of our data needs. Uh, and then one of the things that we're actually super proud of is that we have um, more than half of our 1,500 employees using Looker each month, which I think really speaks to what we've been able to accomplish here, especially when you consider the fact that most of those users are people that are not used to interacting with a BI tool and are usually content creators, writers, editors, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so a little bit in terms of what's next for us. Um, we're starting to uh, experiment with a new tool that you guys are going to hear more about today and tomorrow. Uh, we were one of the early access partners for BigQuery Machine Learning. Uh, this is something that we're really excited about because um, it allows us to really open up uh, machine learning to a lot more of our analysts, whereas previously there were a much you know, more stringent technical requirements in terms of who can do that type of work. Um, this is also something that's been um, developed in partnership with Looker, which is really cool for us because it allows us to sort of just plug in um, and see sort of some, some things like um, our model performance statistics right in the Looker experience that we're used to using. Um, to that end, we're actually continuing to expand pretty heavily on our existing recommendation systems. So this is something that um, actually powers a lot of what you see on the BuzzFeed site. And even what you see on our Facebook pages, it's all ha happening behind the scenes, but it's stuff that uh, you might not realize is there. So our f it's the way that we optimize our feeds. This is the way that we're recommending content to our social media editors to post on our different Facebook pages. We have about 140 of those, so you can imagine that that gets to be a pretty complicated problem for them. Um, so this is a place where we're investing super heavily, and, and our uh, use of GCP and, and BigQuery has allowed us to 
uh, really reduce a lot of the friction there and, and move much more quickly. Uh, and then we're also working on our own materialized view solution. Um, so we actually are just finished our, our version one launch of this and are starting to launch on version two. So this is the solution that's akin to uh, Looker's persistent derived table solution. So we really liked the idea of being able to have sort of cached aggregations that we could access, but what we didn't like was having that locked specifically into Looker because we were running into these scenarios where, say, a data scientist was working on a model and wanted to access our denormalized uh, Facebook statistics. And that was only in Looker, and suddenly you're hitting the Looker API and then having to do all this additional manipulation. So what we decided to do was actually build um, our own solution for this, and our data engineering team, who again is sitting right there, has been so great through this process. Um, and I personally, as a, as a big user of this, could not be more thrilled with the way that it's, uh, it's turned out. But this is something that we think is going to be really crucial for us in terms of upping our game, in terms of our data government, governance, having really consistent ways that we think about um, cleaning up our data, aggregating our data. So this is actually a bit of the work that I'm sort of the most excited about um, right now.